Hi, and thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry, where I've just finished building this cedar garden trellis slash obelisk project. Due to the complexity of building a project like this based on a triangular footprint rather than a rectangular one, I've broken the build process into three parts. The first part I'll show is milling the material for the slats and for the legs, and then making a scarf joint fixture for cutting the angle on the top of the legs where they mount to the finial. In part two of the video series, I'll show how to make a hexagonal blank for the finial by laminating pieces of two by six together. And then in part three, I'll show the fixtures that I made to cut these steep, sharp compound angles on the X bracing and these horizontal slats. In this part of the series, I'll cover how I laminated pieces of cedar two by six into a square blank and then milled that into a hexagon that I then took to a friend's shop and turned on his lathe to produce this finial. I'm showing the sequence for making the square billet and turning it into a hexagon, but I'm not showing the part where I turn it on the lathe because frankly, I really don't know what I'm doing with the lathe. I got the job done, but I'm not gonna be teaching anybody how to do that. So all you get to see is a little bit of the sanding at the end. Here's how it went. size of the finial on the obelisk meant that I needed a pretty good size blank to turn that finial from. I could use a piece of 6x6 six six to make the blank for the finials, but because the finial is just over 2 feet long, I didn't want to buy an 8 foot 6x6 six six to turn it from. So I'm just going to laminate some of the cedar 2x6 to make the blank that that finial is turned out of. Because of the relatively low cost of the cedar 2x6 and the high cost of the setup and going through the process, I'm going to go ahead and make blanks for two finials while I'm at it. I'll rough cut the two by sixes into thirds and mill them from there because that minimizes the effect this much bow has on the pieces during the milling process. I want these pieces of 2x6 to have perfectly flat and smooth faces so that the glue joints are tight and durable in the finished turning. Before I run pieces over the joiner or through the thickness planer, I always clean them up with a sharp putty knife, which helps remove any bits of rock or sand or dirt that got embedded in the wood in the lumber yard or transporting it. This little step really helps to extend the life of my joiner and planer knives because one little speck of sand in the face of a board will nick that knife. So any embedded grit I can save with this step saves time and money later with the cost of new blades and the time spent to switch them out. It's also not a bad idea to put a quick scribble on the faces to keep track of them during the milling process. The next step in the milling process is to flatten one face of each board on the joiner. I love this Powermatic PJ882 joiner with the parallel bed adjustment feature. I can quickly dial in the setting I need. And with the upgraded Bird Shelix cutter head, I get a nice smooth pass with little effort. The next step for making these laminated blanks is to clean up the parallel face on each of the two by sixes and a pass through this noisy machine makes quick work of a smooth parallel surface. Running that final light pass on the side that I initially flattened on the joiner, smooths out the milling marks from the helical cutter head, provides a perfectly smooth surface, which is great for the glue joint. Next, I'll send these pieces through the joiner again, and that will square up the edge and remove any roundness that remains on the edges of these two by sixes, because I want a smooth, solid, consistent face on the blank when it's glued up. A skinny eighth of an inch is usually enough to do it. As the pieces come off the joiner, I make sure to stack the trued edges on the right so that when I take them to the rip fence, 
I'm cutting the width of the board off the clean straight face. And it doesn't hurt to put a pencil mark on things once in a while to keep it organized in case something gets flipped around. I want to start out with a blank that's pretty close to square. So the finished thickness of these three laminations is four and three sixteenths strong. So that's what I'll set the table saw at to rip these. The cedar can be some kind of slippery stuff. So I put on a pair of Smurf gloves for doing this part. Next, I'll glue these laminations together in bundles of three using type on three waterproof glue because these will be used outside. Everybody's got their favorite glue application method. This is just the one I use. Like this little silicone pan, little silicone roller. Seems to do wonderfully for this work. I kind of dial in the amount of glue for the wood. It looks like I got way too much here, but that's all right. If it ends up as too much, I got a quick way of dealing with that. But as I'm spreading out, maybe it's going to be a good amount. It's a little strong. So I'm going to take the next lamination, pull a little of that glue off of there, and re roll this out. I put one little bead right down the middle. Make sure that's all good. This lamination on there. Wiggle it around and now I already have that much glue going for me on this next joint. So I can back off on the amount of glue I add. But I will always err on the side of too much glue than not enough. I'm happy with that. I'm going to add just a little strip there. Like I said, I want to make sure that I err on the side of too much glue. Not gluing this layer so that I don't end up with a 4x8 blank. Let's see if I can gauge the amount of glue a little closer on this one. Definitely use a roller or some method of spreading the glue around by just putting on a zigzag pattern of glue on a lamination like this. I don't count on the glue to spread itself out adequately and evenly enough under the clamping pressure. I don't want to have gaps or starved glue joints in the finished turned finial. And I oriented the grain of these pieces so that when the finial is turned, it has a fine grain on the outside of the turning. I don't want a growth ring to be concentric with the outside of the finished turning because that would tend to make it flake off. So I've oriented the grain so that the finished product will have the finished surface that I'm after. The whole thing ends up as kind of a slippery, gooey sandwich. But I keep fleshing up the edges as the clamping pressure squeezes the glue out. And I'm adjusting the angle of the clamp so that the pressure is straight together instead of going sideways, which makes these laminations slip like that. A little at a time. I've got plenty of extra length in these blanks, so some tolerances aren't critical. But I like to get it as close as I can to make the process a little smoother later on. Hey, there's no glue coming out of that joint. I think I'm going to have a problem. Oh wait, <laughs> that separates the two blanks. My glue has grabbed enough to keep the laminations from squirming around. So I can take this out of the vise and add more clamps. This is what I'm after, this 
squeeze out all the way along all the joints. That way I know there's going to be no gaps in the finished turning. The weight of the blanks and all the clamps starts to make this thing a little beastly by the time I get happy with it. This bottom joint isn't getting quite as much squeeze out as I like to see, but I know I put that other bead of glue in there, so I'm confident that by the time the blank and the turning are complete, that I'll be cut into the place where this joint is glued solidly. That glue's still squeezing out a little bit. Give all the clamps another twist. And now to clean up the bulk of this messy squeeze out, I grab my bucket of sawdust. It's just a bucket of sawdust I save. Anytime I'm cutting melamine particle board, sawdust is really fine and consistent. Not long shreds, it's almost powdery, but not quite powdery. And by blotting the sawdust into the glue, and then scraping off the excess with a sharp putty knife, Get a nice clean blank without having to scrub with a carbide scraper or something later when the glue is dry. I don't like using warm water in a rag to clean this up. It just makes that diluted glue soak into the wood. I don't like to do that. Anybody who's been taught that way, I'm not going to argue with them. As long as I only have to clean up after myself. And maybe it's just me, but I'd much prefer clean up that extra glue with a little bit of sawdust at this stage rather than waiting till the glue gets all set up, but that's just me. I'll write the approximate time here that I was done with the glue to remind me when I've got enough setting time to undo the clamps. Now that I've given the glue and the blanks a chance to dry, I left them overnight. Three or four hours would have been plenty. I'll unclamp them and then use the joiner, thickness planer, and table saw to mill them into the hexagonal blanks I need for turning the finials. And I really like these Jorgensen heavy duty bar clamps for a project like this. They're heavy enough to get a lot of clamping pressure, but not so big and clunky that they take up a lot of space in the shop. So they're agile and effective. first step for machining these into hexagons is to establish a 90 degree corner between two faces. I'll do that on the joiner. And because that 90 degree corner is so essential to an accurately shaped hexagon, I want to make sure the fence is at 90 degrees to the table. So I'll double check it with a machinist square. I can see that the fence is set dead accurate because there's no light showing between it and the square. Because of the process I use for gluing up and laminating these blanks, it doesn't take much of a pass on the two faces to true them up and square them up to each other. When I'm done, I'll mark the corner to show which one's 90 degrees so they can plane the other two surfaces to end up with a square block. I'd call that dead accurate. Keeping in mind the square corner indicating the two plane surfaces, I'll scribble on the other two surfaces so that I know when they've got a thorough pass in the thickness planer. The thickness planer is by far the loudest machine in the shop, so the heavy duty hearing protection is a good idea for that operation. Rather than use the depth gauge built into the planer, which I don't rely on for the accuracy needed on this kind of a project, I raise the planer head and feed one of the blanks partway through and then lower the cutter head to the point it engages the work and starts making a light pass. When the blank comes out, I lower the cutter head about another quarter of a turn or so and then feed both blanks through at that setting to get a nice clean even cut, taking away a minimal amount of wood without a bunch of measuring and trial and error. Man, that thing's noisy. You can't see it in the video, but there's a force field here between me and the planer, so that noise doesn't bother me while I'm standing here talking. With that process all done, I've got two perfectly square blanks milled on four sides. Everything's wonderful. I'll trim the ends up on a miter box and lay out the hexagon.
There's two obvious orientations for laying out a hexagon on this square blank. And I'm going to choose this one that orients two of the points on a diagonal to the faces of the block rather than this one. It yields a slightly larger hexagon so I can get a bigger piece out of the same size blank, a little more efficient use of the material. I'm sure there's a hundred ways of laying out this hexagon, but I'm doing it this way by first marking the center with diagonals because that'll be important with the lathe as well. Next I'll draw a couple 60 degree marks off this diagonal line. Where these lines hit this outside face marks the other apexes of the hexagon. My geometry teacher would probably cringe if he saw the way I was doing this and the way I'm hacking the terminology, but hey, I'm getting the job done, right? So there's the hexagon. I can inscribe a circle that represents the diameter of the finial on the top of this turning. It's a little extra messing around to get another eighth of an inch or so in size on the hexagon, but what the heck, we can do it, so let's. The two most straightforward cuts to begin with on shaping this hexagon are going to be these two 45 degree sides here. So we'll start with that on the table saw. I'll leave a little extra meat on both sides that can be planed off further along as the final passes on the hexagon blank. This setup will be a little different depending on the table saw you're using. Mine's an old unisaw with a right tilt blade. Most saws nowadays are left tilt. So I've got to switch the fence, but not everybody will. I'm making a note on this end of the blank so that I use it each time for pattern setups. Like I said, I'll leave a little extra wood on the blank, which can be planed off to smooth things up later. and gives me a comfort margin in sizing these pieces. I find Smurf gloves a good idea for this sort of operation to keep a firm hold on the block. Referring again to the pattern layout on the end of the blank, the next two cuts are going to be a 30 or 60 degree cut on either side indexing off this long point, which is identical on both blanks. So I'll switch the angle setting and make those two cuts. Once the first two cuts are made, I've got to move the fence over to compensate for the amount of material that was cut off. I'll need to do that again for the final two cuts. It's important during this process to keep the blanks oriented the same way. Anytime I flip the pattern end for end, I flip the other blank end for end. Anytime I rotate the pattern, I rotate the other one so that I'm making the same cuts in the same sequence on both pieces. Now that the bevels are all cut, on the table saw, I'll make some strategic passes through the thickness planer to give the hexagon its final shape and smooth finish. As a small aside here, anytime I'm doing a project that ends up with nice 45 degree cutoffs like these, I tend to hang on to them because they work very well while painting and other things, glue ups, so that I can set pieces on them like this. That way they end up being supported by the fine edge of the scraps and keeps the work clean and manageable. Otherwise, they end up in the kindling box like the rest of the scraps. To end up with a true hexagon that's the same dimension across all six facets, I'm going to mark them strategically before I run them through the planer. And I just want to mark one, two, and three on both cylinders. And then I'll mark these three faces separately I'm going to go with a squiggle on these three and straight lines on these three. It's 
squiggles and lines is what I made up for today. Now I'll adjust the planer to take a slight pass off of this face and repeat that same thickness on each of the three. Then I have three finished milled faces. Then I'll lower the cutter head setting by a 32nd of an inch or so and do the remaining three faces, which makes all of them parallel to each other and leaves a true hexagon. Well, that ended up being involved enough going through the process, starting with two by six cedar pieces all the way through to ending up with these finished hexagon blanks that are ready for turning a finial on them. As I said at the beginning of the video, I'm not going to show the part where I actually turned the finial on the lathe at my friend's shop. Here you just see me doing a final check of the profile for the spearhead finial and then using a piece of belt sander belt to give the turning a nice smooth texture that will be ready for the stain finish that this triangle trellis will get when it's placed in the garden where it will live. So thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. I hope that there was enough about this process that you learned and made it worth watching. And I always appreciate comments. Viewers come up with some really good tips and insights, things that I didn't build into the process that I should have, and a few things that I did and shouldn't have. All those comments drive the discussion forward and help viewers and subscribers take their skills to the next level. I'll have a link here for the build out for the rest of the triangle trellis, and I'll also add one for how to draw arcs for gates, which is a somewhat related topic that you might find interesting. So thanks for watching.